Hi everyone. So this is Mehreen Tahir. Uh, a little bit of introduction. I'm working as a software engineer right now, and um, also I'm a C# -sharp corner MVP, and I'm also leading one of its chapter in Pakistan. So today we are going to talk about serverless machine learning, and basically this would be just a getting started guide for everyone. So if you find it interesting, you can ping me later uh, on Twitter or on any other social media platform. Um, to discuss uh, the resources or if you want to you know just take it ahead and do something more fun with it. Um, before we start uh, I would like to ask everyone who's listening to me right now to please go ahead and donate because this conference is for a good cause so even one dollar counts so please um, I would request everyone please donate for the good cause. Yeah, I think let's start so uh, for this session's agenda, we are going to talk about what is serverless uh, and how how it is revolutionizing our um, our whole architecture of computing. Then we'll talk about uh, some serverless providers. Uh, we'll also see serverless architecture with Azure functions. Uh, then later we'll build a sample ML function and predicting the species of iris flower. OK, so actually, uh, why are we even concerned about serverless machine learning? So cloud computing has changed the way in which we model software and solutions. There is a constant demand for more efficient, economic and intelligent solutions. And also, uh, uh, why serverless machine learning? Why am I talking is because machine learning is basically powering the next breed of built-in intelligent softwares. And serverless computing is redefining how we use cloud computing platforms to attain new levels of application development, uh, simplicity, efficiency, and also productivity. So that's why uh, this session would be all about how we can combine the two approaches and get the best of both worlds. What? OK, so what is actually serverless computing? Uh, it's an execution model uh, where you load code at some level to a serverless cloud provider, and the cloud provider is responsible for executing your code by dyna uh, dynamically allocating the resources. So it's an event-driven model uh, in which your application uh, would respond to events and trigger happening in real time. This is also uh, known as function as a service. Uh, okay, so before I talk about the how we got here, um, I think I would sum it up once again. Serverless is just you know event driven, auto scaling, micro billing cloud architecture, uh, which handles infrastructure management for you and asks you to pay per resource execution and consumption. Uh, you don't need to invest time on infrastructure provisioning or management. Uh, for example, like you, you don't have to create servers or install updates or patch the OS. Uh, this would be more like you know just develop and deploy. Okay, so uh, uh, to talk about how we got here, let's first take a look at what were the steps we were following before. Time. Um, those of you who are old enough in the industry, they would remember as physical machines. It was those large flat boxes, extensive industrial grade components. They were generally placed inside data centers and redundant power supplies, high end speed networks, and everything. So these servers were installed usually in a server rack, powered up, and connected to the network. After the initial installment of the uh, operating system and patches, uh, it would need you know, to configure the web servers, databases, and caches. Um, so only after the proper configuration, application code would finally be copied to each server, and uh, to end the setup was you know, just the beginning. Uh, you would have to monitor it, patch continuously, and new server add, but, you know, you, when uh, there are more users, then you would have to add more servers as well. And it would usually take like months to deploy. Uh, but after that predicted period of higher network traffic, the newly installed servers 
would just lie dormant there and it would cause like organization a lot of money so the only rational driver at advantage for this installing physical servers is retaining absolute control over the hardware and so uh, after that we actually got the advent of virtualization technology and particularly hardware support for it back into cpus around like 2005 i guess so physical server uh, could be efficiently split into multiple smaller virtual servers or virtual machines here so those expensive ten thousand dollar servers uh, that were over provision now they could be split into like smaller two thousand dollar servers and you know you can uh, install separate copies of your operating systems like uh, one server might one server might be running on linux and one might be running on window completely isolated from the other virtual servers uh, so uh, there was no modification required to any existing software uh, and it basically handled a lot of stuff for the organization that they had to do before this uh, like server installation, setting up storage devices, and handling the network setup. But still, there are some tasks uh, that a developer or an organization has to do, which is like how often should you patch your servers, or how how should uh, how often should you backup, and uh, which operating system you should be running, or who will monitor your app and stuff like that. So to uh, address such concerns, another concept was introduced, uh, I think back in 2007 or something, uh, of containerization. So uh, the concept was to run within a single host operating system. So the program being executed only consumes you and memory within the container. When it starts, uh, the application program inside, it starts like regular program but it's restricted by the operating system to run in isolation. Uh, so basically, it gives you resource usage and faster startup. Now, uh, since, you know, like I said, the containers are giving resource usage and faster startup, so this started to think uh, that maybe there could be something uh, we can do which is only which only uses resources when we request it and then immediately shut it down to save resources. So instead of keeping a copy of developer code running continuously at all times, and you know that would be incurring you bill as well. So provider could now wait for a user request and only get the container with the developer's code to send the request. After the developer's code responds to the request, the container would be destroyed, freeing uh, systems resources for other requests. So uh, this leads to the very definition uh, that we talked of serverless paradigm uh, in the very beginning, that it is short-lived uh, containerized environment that are created to service individual requests and other events. So this the unit of scale for serverless is functions. You deploy your whole application uh, as a bunch of functions, and you can deploy it like in milliseconds, and it only lives for months. So as long as you have a particular code, piece of code is running, you would only be for that. Uh, so much talk about history and stuff. Uh, let's actually move now to serverless as advanced. So um, first thing to talk about is abstractions of servers. So all serverless computing actually is using servers and takes place on servers, but you don't have to deal with them. Uh, as a developer, you never have to worry about um, servers. So it, it gives you a layer of abstraction. It separates you from, from the lower middle uh, level. And you only have to, you know, worry about your board and stuff. So these servers, like underlying servers, will be managed by a vendor. And it will frees you from, you know, uh, creating and expanding your application without being uh, constrained by server capacity. Uh, 
and it is very scalable. So when you build an application with a serverless infrastructure, it will scale automatically as the user base grows or usage increases. Uh, if a function needs to be run in multiple instances, the vendor's server will start up, run, and add end them as they are needed, often using containers. So to start up more quickly than they have been run recently. As a result, uh, what happens is the server's application will be able to handle the unusual high number of requests, just as well as it can process a single request from a single user, uh, and uh, your servers won't crash. You so a traditionally structured application with a fixed amount of server space can be overwhelmed by a sudden increase in user. So you might have heard you know, of, uh, how Amazon failed to serve Friday and stuff. Okay, so the next thing, is, uh, the next advantage actually is reduced DevOps uh, because when we use serverless infrastructure, uh, there is no need to upload code to servers or do any backend configuration in order to release a working version of our application. So you can just quickly upload bits of code and release a new pro product. Uh, you can upload your code all at once or one function at a time. And since application is not a single monolithic stack, but uh, rather a collection of functions, provisions, it's easy to ship your product. Or reduce time to is You can possibly to quickly update, patch, fix, add new features, or you know, just remove previous features or bugs from your application. Whole application. Uh, instead, you can just update one function at a time, which is causing the problem, and boom, you go. Also, an uh, application since it is not hosted on an origin server, so your code can be running from. An, uh, it's also possible for the vendors that they can run your application functions on server that are closer to the end user. So this also reduces the like, latency because requests for the user don't have to travel all the way from the origin server, and they'll be served from the nearest available server. And it also makes it highly available. Uh, next is of course billing. Uh, so we are not charged for the idle resource. It will be only charged for the using resources and the time execution of our function. So uh uh, going serverless means you offload the hardest part, the parts of managing server infrastructure. Um, your cloud vendor would be responsible for things like scaling, networking, resources, and everything else that is related to bare metal. So serverless computing lets you focus on application logic and feature development logic rather than running servers. And uh, okay, so it, it's not like oh. All that China is not gold. There are things as well. Uh, if if you are developing serverless machine layer, a serverless application, then your project planning and budgeting. Because you would want to make sure your cloud vendor supports languages and frameworks that are to your application and aligned with your team's city. Uh, also, if it's easy to develop the your environment, managing if there are anything you need, integrate the serverless components with other aspects of your application. So I, I think you should take into account all that, but still that the benefits overweigh the cost for many many applications. Uh, so what are the options do we have when we are talking about serverless? 
So all the major cloud vendors are already in the game. Uh, they provide uh, serverless computing options for a developer. For example, uh, Microsoft Azure Functions uh, that we are going to take a look. They are provided by Microsoft, of course. Uh, next is Alibaba Cloud Function Compute, which are uh, provided by Alibaba Cloud. Um, Amazon uh, AWS Lambda. Amazon Web Services also provide them. And then Google Cloud Functions, and there are also IBM Cloud Functions, uh, which uses basically Apache or WISC. to Microsoft Technologies, we're going to take a look into architecture with Azure Functions. So, they're um, planned by uh, Microsoft. Uh, and event driven uh, we speak uh, we talked about like serverless is event driven so this is also event driven and it allows you to easily run smaller pieces of your code in the cloud so there, there are going to be built-in triggers um it could be http or or any other uh, timer um, and there are also other events available from azure event hub service and then there so you can use blob or you can use cosmos db uh, q or yeah. uh, any function or output service and it also supports uh, c sharp javascript f sharp java and python uh, you can test debug locally using your preferred ide or uh, you can also use web based interface uh, when your code is ready, you can just, you know, choose from a variety of uh, deployment models, including uh, continuous deployment using app service uh, or continuous integration in many of the popular source code repositories, uh, zip upload, run directly from a package, many other. Um, so there's a lot of talk. Uh, I'm sure uh, we'll start talking about what actually going to do. So uh, what we are going to do, uh, we are going to trade, um, create an HTTP trigger using Azure Functions, which would make use of our uh, model. And, uh, yeah. So this is the feature. The classification. Uh, okay, so if you're going to uh, load, we're, since we're going to use so, uh, so there are uh, uh, resources available on the internet. So don't that you can use <coughs> to have your uh, okay. so Okay, so I'm going to use a Visual Studio Code, uh, which is also an IDE provided by Microsoft. Uh, I'm, I'm just on desktop right now. Uh, and from here, we're going to start building our. So like I said, you need to have Python installed. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a virtual environment. First, uh, we need to activate it. So you need to tell where where is your environment slice. Mm, oops. Okay. Uh, so from here on, everything is going to be really simple. Trust me on it. So to create 
function uh, the command is starts from func f u n c so this is um, going to be your predate function kind of command you are going to predate uh, is so I'm just creating a function I'm not really sure if you guys can say it okay so for now it's asking us to choose a runtime um, we are going to do it in Python so I'm choosing option 3 and now it's going to just create a thing for us so uh, let's go ahead and open folder Okay, my system is messing with me. No worries. Okay, I'm I'm using actually a virtual machine right now because this is the easiest way you can do it. Uh, you can also uh, create Azure functions on Windows, but you need to have a uh, Linux system installed, like Linux, which uh, 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 is going to do uh, is we are actually going to create a new function using func new command. It will ask us which kind of function we would like to build. We are going to trigger, is it trigger um, HTTP, uh, or service bus? So, so there are Hi, Mary. Uh, I think your voice is breaking. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, but it's very slow. Sorry. Okay. Um, not really sure what, yeah. what happened. I think now it's fine. Yeah, now it's fine. Okay. Uh, so, um, getting, uh, uh, from using found new command, and I'm going to select HTTP trigger. Uh, now, I have to name our, um, I'm just going to say, uh, here with uh, which is named like okay um for thing first uh, I'm going to use a pre-trained model since training a model is out of scope of this session uh, I already have a model that I'm going to use um uh, 
Alright, try it. So, uh, okay. So I'm just gonna like copy paste it here. Uh, also train your model using Azure uh, Azure ML Studio online, or uh, you can use uh, Jupyter Notebook to train your model, uh, like we do with any other uh, machine learning stuff. So you, you can you know save your model and bring it here, or you can also uh, train. It. But uh, I think that's a lot of time, so I just retrain it and save it. Uh, for requirements, so uh, all the requirements that you have, you need to mention it. Um, we're going to use Azure Function 1.0.0. Uh, mention whatever. So then also need Azure Functions Worker. Uh, again, I'm going to specify. Um, which version I need, that would be 1.0.086. Um, so this file uh, is basically con uh, is going to contain every requirement that you have for your function and your model to run. So uh, and, uh, all the packages, uh, let's say like NumPy, SkyPy, or those kind of stuff, you're going to need those here. Uh, we are also going to need protobuf. Who know what is protobuf? I said it has nothing related to protobuf on it, so you can just you know go ahead and um, we need NumPy. Uh, we also need sklearn and SkyPy. So we have our requirements in place now. Um, let's move to our main function. Um, I'm just going to create a file called going to contain all this code. Uh, we need Azure functions. Uh, we also need to import pickles. And um, we also need OS and explain later why why do we need all, all these packages and stuff. So uh we'll find our main function and uh, here we also need to specify And the kind of trigger that we are using, which is HTTP request. Okay. Um, first thing, uh, we are going to load our model. So this is like open um, the directory that we have. Uh, so predict. And our model name. Is, uh, we're going to request new features for our sample. So, you know, Flowers has symbols and battles. So, first thing, uh, let's specify as our feature uh, node. Okay. Again, going to load. Uh, actually, I'm going to copy this. 
Now this would be like one. Name it whatever you want here. So it's name it like okay. So this is okay. So um, now we need to set new sound. So let's say uh, what it's going and then uh, it goes for better lens. Okay. Okay. And now we're going to add a few random features in it. So let's just say that number of features are n is going to be 40. Uh, we are just going to use random function from NP. So the new flower will get random features. You can also like short name it. I'm just Naming it for the sake of reading. Um, so the and then going to use um now so till this part we're going to get our new floor that we need to predict and now the time for you know Placing the prediction prediction um building our dot and we're going to predict our new flower with random features and the function will be done as an array um yeah after converting it into String prediction. So what we did here, we just added like uh, random features after loading our pre-trained model, uh, and you know you're going to predict our new like lens and vector lens and stuff. So before uh, triggering this function, what we're going to do, um, there is a uh, script file function. Uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, function dot JSON. Um, and you can see we have this script file uh, which specifies underscore underscore, but it's is the main, so we are just going to do this. Okay, I think we we don't have our uh, function uh, environment set up right here. So, uh, 
environment activated so i'm just activating it okay uh, so now uh what we know what are the requirements we mentioned then it's gonna go install minus r Okay, so it's going to be uh, go to get all the packages and install them. Um, what I can do is can also open the secret. So, sorry, previously created function. I'm just connecting a secret game. Um, yeah, we have a in place here. Okay, so I was. And uh, this is same as what we did. Okay, so it's here. Uh, to run the function, when we do is... And you can So, I uh, make a plan. Because... Uh, I have already uh, okay. So get on and Metal length, whatever you have on your local host, and uh, you will get the prediction. I'm because I cannot really run this one uh, since it is deployed. I mean, I can show you how to deploy a function. So, uh, Azure already here. Uh, Sign in your account uh, when you click like sign in. Thank you to account. Um, right now I'm using student sound. Um, let me show you that I already have this. Uh, you'll most probably have like local project right here. You can go uh, to this arrow, state deploy to function app. Click on it. It's going to open. Uh, on what's the uh, in your you may specify name first of all. Uh, 
said i it is completely locked me out can you basically logging waiting to log in so you you need to press this button like deployed function app you need to specify a name that you are going to use uh, for your function to create and uh, it will create a storage around for you it will create a function app for you and everything so i what i can do right now is i can show you what i have Right. This is at in the added portal. Uh, it is going to show you all the resources that you have created earlier on and everything. I I think most of you would be familiar with this already. So here is my function that I already did. Hopefully, this is going to give it a minute. Okay, while it's putting, if you guys have. Question, uh, please shoot them. Does that mean no questions? Uh, no, no, so far, no questions. Is. Okay. So you see it has our um, function uh, created in the mentioned while creating it. It is going to show us. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I just for the instruction that there is a bad here. And for the people living in this area, that means you are not going to have proper access to the internet. So um, when we go on the URL, it shows us that our function app is up and running. Uh, yeah, so you guys have any question or anything? Right, I think I can use it here. Um, Let me just try and run it. Okay, okay, thank God. Uh, so, uh, so now uh, we have our requirements in place uh, and you can see that we have this URL uh, which says that we can get our prediction on this URL. So localhost 7071 slash API slash predict. Um, so you can open it in your browser as well or uh, what other thing we can do is we can create another terminal. 
Okay, great. And uh, what we're going, we are going to get our prediction right inside our terminal. So for that, uh, we are going to use curve. Um, This might look ugly to you guys, but once you have it in place, it will be fine. Uh, so local host that it mentioned. Okay, so um, now we need to specify what the function is, which is in our case predict. And then we need to supply it the features that we uh, use. So like beta length, um, let's say it's 2.0 since we use load. And uh, the other feature was its width. Um, let's say it's 2.0 as well. Like no. And then uh, our sequel length, um, 3.0. So if you guys have already worked with machine learning or something, you you would know what is it. So uh, for last, we're going to specify circle width, which is um, let's say 3.0, and enter. Okay. that's a tad okay okay so now you have the prediction that it says the um, features I mentioned here like beta length of two and three is from iris setosa uh, we can also change features uh, and see if it works the other way um so I, I don't think it has any four but Yeah, so this time, since we changed our features, now it tells us that this is Iris Virginica. Okay, so I think we can also deploy this function, and that would be easier. Uh, so um, here, deploy to function. Um, we need to tell uh, which is it. So let's just say uh, this is our function right now. Predict iris and do get this. And then which one I want, I'm, I'm just going to deploy it using my Azure for student. Um, we need to create a new function in Azure. Specify a name. Let's just, just say iris function. It should be named Uh Then we need to specify the environment. Uh, we use Python, so I'm using Python to win six. Um, the next thing it's going to do is select the in resource. So I should be like any server which is. I think uh, at least you guys got the procedure that what is going on. The rest it's going to do all of it, but when it starts, it's going to take very long time. So you can, you know, put it on deployment, go take a nap, and come back, and it might be there when you come back. Might be, I'm not sure. Okay, thank God. So I'm just using like Central US. And now you can see uh, it's certain providers. Let me expand it a little. So it's going to use our functions extension. By the way, you also do Python. Uh, extension. 
Azure on Azure Functions. Um, the last this long time um that you do ask or you can in the data as well. 